Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Questions on the Parsha. This week's Parsha is Parsha Mishpatim, and I've got some questions for you. Okay, the first one is in the 22nd chapter and the first line. The line is this. Im ganav, vamet, ein lo damim. If the thief is found tunneling into your house and you strike him down and he dies, he has no blood. This is the Torah's assertion that you have the right of preemptive defense. As Rashi says there on that line, it teaches us that if someone's coming to kill you, you should get up early and kill him first. The first question is a moral question. Is what's the basis for such self-defense? But on a deeper level, I'd like you to consider this. Why does the Torah teach this to you? Ein lo damim. It's as if he's already dead. If you have the right to kill him, then why not just say, defend yourself? Why does the Torah phrase it, ein lo damim? Okay, question number two. Once again, a word question. In the 22nd chapter, in the 20th line, we encounter the word ger. Ger lo tone lo til hatseno. Right? You shouldn't oppress or put undue pressure on the ger because gerim haitem be'eretz mitzrayim because you were gerim in the land of Egypt. And in the 23rd chapter, in the 9th line, we see a similar statement. The ger lo til chatz. You shouldn't put pressure on the ger. Why? Because you know the soul of the ger because you were gerim in Egypt. This is a repeated theme that we were gerim in Egypt and therefore we should not oppress the ger. What does this word mean? Its first usage, interestingly enough, is in the 15th chapter of Breshit and the 13th line, where it says, Ger yezarecha be'aret lo lahem. That is what's known as Brit ben habitarim, the covenant between the pieces, where Avram is both promised the land and promised that his children will be gerim in Egypt. So what does this word ger mean? And if you want to think a little deeper about it, what does it teach us about our responsibility in receiving all the mishpatim, all the laws of the Torah? Okay, last question. In the 24th chapter, in the seventh line, right, it says, V'ikach sefer habrit, right? Moshe took the book of the brit, the Kraba Ozne'am, and he read it to all the people. Rav Yomru, and they said, Kol asher diber Hashem na nishma, everything which God says, we will do, and then we will understand. Right, the famous statement where Am Yisrael was willing to do everything before we even knew what it was. So what I want to know is why does this wide open, boundless commitment come when the Torah is called Sefer Habrit? What does this word Brit teach us? Now it's important to know that only a few lines earlier, in line three, the people already said, we'll do whatever God says. But not Naseh Nishma, just Naseh. And then in line four, Moshe, it says Moshe writes down the words of the Torah, and it doesn't call it Sefer Brit. Now remember, Brit has a long history in the Torah up to this point. There's the Brit of Noah, symbolized by the rainbow. There's Brit Ben Abitarim, which we just mentioned, the covenant between the pieces where Avram is promised the land. And then, of course, there's Brit Milah, the sign of the covenant in the flesh. As a last thought to take away with you as you wonder what this word Brit means, the word Breshit can be taken apart, and the Aish can be taken out of the middle and put to the side, and it becomes Brit Aish, a fiery covenant. So I want to know, what does this word Brit mean? And why is the people's wide open commitment to Sefer HaBrit and not to Sefer HaTorah? Okay, those are our questions for this week. Until this time next week, Shabbat Shalom.